So it turns out that the chain rule applies no matter how many links are in your chain. And that's actually where the chain rule gets its name from, right? If we're trying to calculate the derivative of a function dy over dx, we can factor the derivative using the chain rule. Uh, that is, the derivative will respect the function composition. So we could have some outer function, y with respect to u, and some inner function, u with respect to x. And if we take those derivatives separately, their product can come together to form the derivative. But let's suppose that u itself has an inner function. So we could take the derivative of y with respect to u, we could take the derivative of u with respect to v, and we can take the derivative of v with respect to x. But what if the function v itself has an inner function, right? We could take the derivative of y with respect to u. We could take the derivative of u with respect to v. We could take the derivative of v with respect to t. We could take the derivative of t with respect to x. And we can keep on going and going and going and going. And as we link these different functions inside of each other, we get to start to see why do we call it the chain rule. All right, so let's look at a specific example. Uh, let's consider the function f of x equals sine of cosine of tangent of x. So we have this triple nested trigonometric function, tangent inside of cosine inside of sine. And so as we try to investigate inner functions, we see that there's one function, tangent of x, uh, that's all by itself. But this tangent function sits inside of the function cosine, which that sits inside of the function sine. And so by the chain rule, we should take the derivative of all of these functions in that sequence. Therefore, the derivative of f with respect to x, we're going to take the derivative of sine, which is going to be a cosine function. We then put its inner function inside, which the inner function here is going to be cosine of tangent of x. Then we're going to multiply that by its inner derivative. That is, we're going to take the derivative of cosine of tangent of x like so. But then what's the derivative of that? Well, let me just copy down cosine of cosine of tangent again. So we have to take the derivative of cosine here. Well, the derivative of cosine is going to be a negative sine of, well, the inner function there is the tangent of x. But then we have to multiply by the inner derivative of that function, which we're going to be taking the derivative of tangent like so. In which case, putting this all together, we have, again, the cosine of cosine of tangent. We're going to have the negative sine of tangent. And then we're going to take the derivative of tangent here, which we know to be secant squared of x. And there's then our derivative here of all these functions. Um, I probably would stick the negative sign out in front of everything so it doesn't look like subtraction by mistake. So you're gonna get negative cosine of cosine of tangent, tangent of x. Then you're gonna get sine of tangent, tangent of x. And then you're gonna get secant squared in which case that would be the derivative of the function. So we can take the derivative of these nested functions just by taking the derivative of one link of the chain at a time. Let's look at another example. Let's take the function g of x to equal the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root of x. All right, how is the links of the chain going on here? So consider the inner function 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root of x. Seems complicated, right? We'll come back to it later. We don't have to do all the links of the chain at once. And we're going to take the outermost function here just to be the square root of x. Now, for the sake of calculation, this is going to be very useful for us. If we have to take the derivative of the square root of u with respect to u, be aware by the power rule, we're just taking the derivative of u to the one-half power. We end up with one-half u to the negative one-half power. But then by the chain rule, we also have to take the derivative of u itself with respect to x. And so putting that together, this will look like u prime over two times the square root of u. So whenever you have to take the derivative of a square root function, you get its derivative on top of whatever the radicand was, that'll sit above two times the square root of u. That's gonna be helpful in this situation. So as we take the derivative of g right here, we end up with, since we're taking the square root, we're gonna get in the bottom two times the square root of one plus the square root of one plus the square root of x. That we get there, but then we get the inner derivative for which you have to take the derivative of one plus the square root of one plus the square root of x, like so. So we haven't done the numerator or the numerator yet. We have to come back to it. Well, taking the derivative of the one plus the square root, well, you're just going to get, you know, the one right there. It'll just go to zero. But we have to take the square root of the derivative of the square root of one plus the square root of x right there, where again, we have this inner function, 
sitting inside of the outer function, which is again the square root of x. So taking this to the next line, we have this 2 times the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root of x. I'm going to put this to the side to make it a little bit easier. So this time when we take the derivative, we're going to get in the denominator 2 times the square root of 1 plus the square root of x. And then sitting on top, we get its inner function, which is going to turn out to be 1 plus the square root of x. We have to take its derivative, like so. But like I said a moment ago, the derivative of 1 is going to be 0, so that it disappears. And so in the end, we're going to get the derivative of the square root of x, which is 1 over 2 times the square root of x. So we end up with something like the following. We're going to get 2 times the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root of x. Uh, that's, that's the first part, so maybe make this a little bit shorter so we get a 1 right there. So that was the first outer derivative. Then like the middle derivative is going to look like 1 over 2 times the square root of 1 plus the square root of x. And then the inner derivative is going to be 1 over 2 times the square root of x. Which, in terms of putting those all together, there's really not much to simplify. We take 2 times 2 by, times 2, which is 8. So we end up in the end, we're going to get 8 times the square root of x times the square root of 1 plus the square root of x times the square root of 1 plus the square root of 1 plus the square root of x, all under 1. And that will be the derivative of the function. And again, the purpose of this, these examples here is to just test how can we calculate the derivative when we nest functions more and more and more and more. Let's do one last example of this. Take y to be e to the secant of 3 theta. And so we see three functions in play here. There's 3 theta which sits inside of the function secant, which sits inside the function e to the power, exponential by e. And so when we take the derivative, the first, you know, the outermost derivative we're going to get is going to be the derivative of an exponential. The natural exponential will just give back itself. So we get e to the secant of 3 theta power. But then we have to times that by the inner derivative, the derivative of secant of 3 theta, which the derivative of secant is secant tangent. So we get secant 3 theta times tangent 3 theta. Then we have to take the derivative of 3 theta, the inner function in that situation, which the inner function then would be 3. And so piecing this together, we see that y prime is going to equal 3 times e to the secant of 3 theta times secant of 3 theta times tangent of 3 theta. And so not all of these nested uh, chains are going to be as messy as maybe the previous example was, but the principle is still the same. If we just take the derivative one step at a time, I do the, the derivative, then the inner derivative, then the next inner derivative, then the next inner derivative, do, do this all the way until you get to the very middle of the function, until you get to the, you know, the chocolate center of your Tootsie Pop there, and then you're going to have the derivative, which we calculated from the chain rule.